on this episode of In the Fight. A routine foot patrol leads to a firefight for 3rd Cavalry Regiment soldiers in Wardak Province. Soldiers on the ground and airmen in the sky team up for coordinated attacks. An eight-man Marine team provides fresh water to an entire base in the Afghanistan desert. Aircraft rescue firefighters train to be the first on the scene in Japan. And NATO unveils its system to counter the threat of ballistic missiles around the globe. Soldiers in some regions of Afghanistan spend day after day patrolling their surroundings on foot. But as Army Sergeant Joe de la Pena reports, these seemingly mundane daily patrols are still one of the most effective ways of uncovering hostile enemies in the area. That's what they want to shoot. At the end of this day, soldiers from Grim Troop of the 3rd Cavalry Regiment had their skills and resolve tested. However, the beginning of this day starts with a typical foot march from Forward Operating Base Airborne that led them here, the Afghan Uniform Police Department in the Maiden Shar District. First Lieutenant Michael B. Matthews, 3rd Platoon Leader of Grim Troop, sits down with the Afghans to discuss the security of the outer laying areas. So Major Halil said that because we were there, we ended up sort of coming at the right time because he had wanted to clear an objective that he suspected was a rocket cache site. So he sent a mounted column down a road into the green zone, which is an area that we can't walk, but they can drive and they often go through. So they attached a guide with us known as we moved up on the mountain to the north. And that's when this normal foot patrol changed into a six hour battle. Yeah, yeah. The biggest experience was the enemy uh, TTP. Um, usually they'll shoot at us and then run. This time they actually stayed and fought. It's a new experience for us. Uh, usually it's they take a couple of shots, throw down their weapons and then walk away and we're usually unable to identify who might have shot at us but this time and they kept engaging us and we were able to return fire. We were able to uh, fixate the enemy in a one location uh, and that's the first time we've been able to do that since we've been out here. Once enemy forces were isolated, Afghan reinforcements swept the green zone where evidence suggests three insurgents were killed and one injured. The firefight proved to be invaluable, boosting not only the Afghan National Security Forces' confidence and fighting ability, but also the intelligence gained. It was invaluable for Grim Troop as well. This was their first firefight in Afghanistan, and they did it without a single injury. Reporting from Forward Operating Base Airborne, I'm Sergeant Joe Della Pena. When military personnel need to get around dangerous areas, hailing a taxi may not be the safest option. Army Staff Sergeant Haley Zimmerman travels with a team tasked with ferrying individuals back and forth while avoiding insurgents and other dangers on the roadway. I don't know, I feel like it's kind of like Mad Max. You just, uh, you never know what you're gonna run into. Day to day is very different, but you have to react and adapt to the situation and always be situationally aware of everything that's going on around you. So it's, it's quite a challenge. The soldiers of ISAF Joint Command Movement Control Team in Kabul, Afghanistan, are tasked with securely moving passengers in and around the city of Kabul. Need, I need two vehicles to do. A dangerous job that puts them in direct contact with the local populace and exposes them to those who would do harm to local coalition members. Driving itself is an already dangerous task, but driving in a combat zone is especially dangerous. Obviously, uh, vehicle-based IEDs are very common as well, so uh, you're always on the lookout for those things, and they're always present. We try to avoid stopping at all costs because stopping puts you at risk. If you're moving, you're much less of a target than if you're stopped on the side of the road. So for the most part, if we can get to, from A to B without opening our vehicles, that's the way we do it. And although the passengers are most likely grateful for the safety measures, they may not appreciate everything about the ride. Some of these vehicles are not the most comfortable vehicles in the world. 
you know, we get them in there, they're safe and secure, and just transporting them as quickly and as safely as possible. Uh, sometimes we have some reactions of gratitude, and sometimes people just uh, can't hold their lunch down. Reporting from the streets of Kabul, Afghanistan, and trying to keep my lunch down, this is Army Staff Sergeant Haley Zimmerman. Deployed service members conduct live fire ranges to keep their weapon skills sharp and to test new capabilities. Marines stationed at Tactical Base Dwyer recently conducted a TOW missile live fire exercise, and Army Sergeant Christopher Toby tells us what made this live fire unique. At that point, you'll be using... Marines with Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, conduct a safety briefing before a range on deck Tactical Base Dwyer. Live fire ranges are nothing new to these Marines, but this particular range brought more spectators to the firing line than participants. We shot two missiles out of the training range tonight at Camp Dwyer. The uh, time of night that we shot was right during the thermal crossover. Obviously made the shot a little more difficult. Lance Corporal Zachary Markward is the only missile specialist firing on the range tonight. He is firing the missiles from a saber system and is able to control the missiles even after they launch to make sure he hits his target. When they fire the missiles at night, they have to use the thermal sensors to monitor the missile's trajectory. And then when you just switch over to thermals in a low light situation, it tends to be a little more difficult, and especially like we had here, we don't have very far range. The missile leaving the tube out of the saber system it creates like a washout or a whiteout for say on the screen where you can't see anything. Tow the wire, tow the wire, tow the wire. I say we did pretty well tonight, and the shot went pretty well. The saber system is able to fire multiple different types of tow missiles and has a highly sensitive thermal lens that is more powerful than many of the unit's other surveillance systems. Charlie Company is the only unit that provides security to TV Dwyer, so the system's capabilities are invaluable to their mission. Being able to control something like that with that much force and that much power is unlike anything that you're ever gonna do in your life. And just knowing that you have that capability, it's an opportunity that you're always gonna remember. It's an experience of a lifetime. Reporting from Tactical Base Dwyer, I'm Sergeant Christopher Toby. This is Lieutenant Robert Billard in Kandahar, Afghanistan. I just wanted to give a shout out to my wife, Kristen, and my daughter, Asuka, living in Okinawa, Japan. I miss you guys, I love you, I can't wait to see you again. Simplify. Hi, I'm Sergeant First Class uh, Felix Gomez from Charlie Company 1-1 BSTV. Giving a shout out to all my friends back at Fort Riley. They send me some venison and some ducks when I get back. We'll be back real soon. Hi, my name is Sergeant First Class Amy Smith at Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan. I'd like to say hello to my family back at Fort Hood. I love and miss you guys. Coming up. Soldiers and airmen train for coordinated attacks and Marines provide fresh water in the Afghanistan desert. Check out divinshub.net for the latest accurate and reliable information as In the Fight continues. What does the military acronym for the TOW missile stand for? The answer when we return. my brother Frank in the Battle of Iwo Jima. He served on four combat tours in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. There's a life that was lost behind that pin. I put it on for my wife. For my husband. My brother. My dad. My son. We wear it because we honor those that we lost. To learn more about the stories behind the Gold Star Pins, visit goldstarpins.org. From combat-related stress, to the day-to-day -day stressors of life. This package is going to be completed. This is the fourth time this week. Stress can affect every Marine and Marine family. The De-Stress Line provides anonymous counseling for Marines and Marine families when it's needed most. If you're feeling the effects of stress, call today and let us help you win your personal battles.
What does the acronym TOE stand for? The answer is A, tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided. Soldiers on the ground and airmen in the sky are a deadly combination for enemy combatants. During Exercise Red Flag, Senior Airman Ross Alexander Whitley followed Air National Guard Joint Terminal Attack Controllers, whose job it is to bridge the gap between ground and air, and files this report. The Army's 5-1 Cavalry is training with the Air Force during Red Flag 14-3. Red Flag Alaska provides the opportunity um, to train our folks at, from the platoon level all the way up through the collective level in a way that I've never seen uh, before in my career. U.S. Air Force and Air National Guard JTACs working with the 5-1 Cav called in airstrikes to red flag pilots. I mean, I've got some gung-ho uh, JTACs that are sitting there that have the ability to make tactical decisions. John 5-3, clear hot. And bringing the full might and power of the United States Air Force to bear at the point and choosing of that ground commander so we achieve the effects that he wants. That relationship is critical, and this is one thing that we've learned. On the previous deployments, um, a lot of times you would deploy overseas and they would join you in theater. You didn't have that time to train up with them. And then through exercises like this, you know, the training, synchronization, um, when we deploy, we're just that more, much more effective. Really that that integration um, of all task forces, whether Army, Marines, Air Force, is really what helps us win wars. And um, so exercises like Red Flag are extremely important um, for all of us. Just as, a, as an example, the mortars that we were watching uh, fire uh, while the airstrikes were being coordinated, I've been flying an A-10 for at least a year and a half, and that's the first time that I've actually seen that happen. So to actually see that and process that integration uh, is awesome for us, as well as for the RD guys. From the Yukon Training Area, I'm Senior Airman Ross Alexander Whitley. Being a first responder in a combat zone requires serious training. 1st Battalion 16th Infantry Regiment soldiers from Fort Riley, Kansas, recently participated in a first responder trauma lane. Army Staff Sergeant Noel Gehrig explains in this report. Soldiers assigned to the 1st Battalion 16th Infantry Regiment Iron Rangers participated in a first responder's trauma lane at Camp Ewing in Kuwait. The training was designed to enhance proficiency in basic life-saving methods and increase medical proficiency among combat medics. Sergeant Saul Martinez, combat medic with 116 Infantry, explains. We had uh, 18 candidates from uh, Iron Ranger Battalion. They competed in a seven mile road march, and then we had them do trauma lanes afterwards that consisted of basically going through uh, basic CLS and TC3 events. Tactical Combat Casualty Care is the guidelines, the protocol that we use as medics. It goes through three different phases of care, and we follow those phases of care throughout combat. The first phase is care under fire, tactical field care is the second phase, and then tactical evac is the third phase. So we use that as our guideline as to how to treat casualties. Staying proficient on these skills is vital to every life on the battlefield. Major Tracy Dominguez, Brigade Surgeon with the 1st Armor Brigade Combat Team, tells us why training like this is important. Well, these skills are perishable, putting on a tourniquet, controlling the bleeding. Uh, if you need to refresh on those skills more than every three months, if you don't continually practice, you won't be ready for the battlefield or combat situation. And especially today's situation where it was done under stress, this is probably the optimum time to train them at when the situation does arise, where they need to utilize their skills, they're familiar with it. When it comes to casualties on the battlefield, each passing moment is critical. The skills the Iron Rangers enhance through this training ensures they will have the proficiency required to make every second count. Reporting for the 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team in Camp Bering, Kuwait, I'm Army Staff Sergeant Noel Garrick. In the desert environment of Afghanistan, providing fresh water is vital for survival. Army Sergeant Christopher Toby shows us how an eight-man Marine team is responsible for providing this necessity to over a thousand service members and civilians at Tactical Base Dwyer. While the kinetic mission in Afghanistan wraps up and the coalition footprint shrinks, the support mechanisms on remote bases are being manned by skeleton crews. Well, there's eight of us running three sites, so we stay pretty busy, especially when something goes down. It requires all of us to work together to get it back up and running as fast as possible. 
Corporal Di Placido is one of only a handful of Marines that provide water, sanitation, and laundry services to tactical-based wire in southwest Afghanistan. The eight Marines on his team support all of the base's water and hygiene needs. Well, first we pull our water out of a well. It goes into our raw water tanks. From our raw water tanks, it goes into our TWIPS, which is tactical water purification systems, their reverse osmosis purification systems. Their filtration system is so effective that it filters the base's water to a higher quality than most bottled water, reducing the total dissolved solids to a level of only three parts per million more than 100 times cleaner than FDA requirements. We put out roughly from 20 to 30,000 gallons a day. We produce about the same, and we support roughly about 1,000 Marines and civilians and sailors out here. As long as it's uh, roughly flat, which it is here, we can uh, use one pump, a 600 gallons per minute pump, to pump out to two miles long. They use their pumps to their maximum effective rate to make sure that their purified water reaches all the parts of the base that need it including a laundry point that they run. On a daily, we wash around 150 bags, which equals about to 2,000 pounds of laundry. The three Marines who are assigned to this post work incredibly quickly. It's more of peace of mind that they can come, uh, bring their laundry here, have it all cleaned, and then have it back the same day. So it's not like they're waiting for a long period of time. Since there's only eight of us, no one can really slack off without affecting the mission and affecting the base. The water they pump is not only for sanitation purposes, but it also enables the chow hall to provide hot meals on a daily basis. While it's incredibly hard work for the small team, they say that they enjoy their mission, particularly in a deployed environment, because they can really see the impact of their efforts. It actually affects Marines out here, and they're very grateful for it, and just hearing them tell us how grateful they are, it really makes me feel better about my job and what I do here. Reporting from Tactical Based Wire, I'm Sergeant Christopher Toby. I'm Sergeant Randy Palacios with the 730 Transportation Company stationed in Bagram, Afghanistan. I'd like to give a shout out to my wife, Rosanna, my two little monsters, Jeremiah and Samuel. I love and miss you guys a lot. Hello, everyone. My name is Master Sergeant Antonio Lopez Milner. I'd just like to say hello to my family back in Eden, North Carolina, and my wife and daughter back in Fort Hood, Texas. I love you and I miss you, and I'll be home soon. Hi, my name is PFC Dietrich Wong. I'm currently here in Kandahar, Afghanistan. I just want to uh, you know, give a shout out to my family and friends back home in Pennsylvania and that uh, we'll be home soon. Private First Class Omari Durham with the 876 Engineer Company, currently stationed at Bargain Airfield. I'd like to give a special shout out to my family back home in Atlanta, Georgia, especially my daughter, Cheyenne Durham. Daddy loves you and I'll be home soon. Coming up, NATO defends against the threat of ballistic missiles and we'll showcase some of the best photos from our service members as In the Fight, presented by Divids, continues. What is the range of a modern intercontinental ballistic missile? The answer when we return. With the new Military 24-7 app from Divids, you turn your favorite mobile device into a window to the front lines. Connect with your nation's finest men and women through our video and photography archives and stay up to date with news reported directly from service members. Quickly share information and breaking stories with friends via Facebook, Twitter, or email. News, photos, video, your military 24-7. Training is about more than muscle. It's about inner strength. So I push myself. That's why I serve in the United States Coast Guard. I train with the best, a team that shares my drive and commitment. We collect intelligence, guard our shores against drug smugglers, and keep our waterways safe because our nation expects more. If you expect more, maybe you were born ready. Find out at GoCoastGuard.com. I want to give a shout out to my family and friends. I want to send a shout out to my husband, to my parents, my family back home. I'd like to give a shout out to my girlfriend, to my family and friends in Lansing, Michigan, to my family out in Tucson, Arizona, to my beautiful wife and children in Des Moines, Iowa, to everybody in Texas, in York, Pennsylvania, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, Harrisonburg, Virginia, Orlando, Florida, Oceanside, California, and Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I love you guys, I miss you, and I hope I'll see you soon.
what is the range of a modern intercontinental ballistic missile? The answer is C, 6,000 miles. When aircraft rescue firefighters aren't responding to emergencies on the flight line, they're training to be the first on the scene. Marine Corporal Anthony Reyes files this report. Aircraft rescue firefighters gear up and strap in to make sure they're ready to protect every jet, helicopter, and plane on Air Station Ibukuni at any given moment. We're on standby 24-7, 365 days a year. There's not a day or an hour on this air station that uh, not a section of aircraft rescue firefighters is protecting the aircraft on this base. The Marines assess the blazing inferno as it moves and reacts, making split-second decisions. Scenarios like this provide a valuable experience but ultimately, extinguishing the flames takes more than just training. We get the physical aspect of it, so I try to try to maintain a you know a good diet, uh, stay healthy, um, and the biggest thing is is just getting to hold that hand line. You know, it's a beast to hold. So uh, anytime I get a chance to you know get a little bit of practice before, it, it really helps out a lot. Through the sweat and fire, the event forges a stronger family. I love coming in every day, spending time with my section. You know. I'd say we're probably one of the tightest uh, group of individuals on this base because we literally live, eat, and sleep together almost every day. We all love coming out here. We love playing with real fire. We love doing our job. And this is just great training that, we, that we're fortunate enough to do every month. Reporting from Marine Corps Air Station, Ibukuni, Japan, I'm Corporal Anthony Reyes. With ballistic missile capabilities ever growing, the threat for international attacks will continue to rise. To counter this threat, NATO has implemented a system to help shield its member nations. NATO Channel correspondent Luca Fazuli tells us more in this report. Over 30 countries worldwide have or are acquiring ballistic missile technology that could eventually be used to carry not only conventional warheads, but also weapons of mass destruction. The proliferation of these capabilities does not necessarily mean there is an immediate intent to attack NATO, but it does mean that the Alliance has a responsibility to take this into account as part of its mission to protect its European populations, territory, and forces. I see missile defense very much as a, an insurance policy, an additional insurance policy. Missile defense is just an extra tool in addition to the other tools that we have to defend ourselves if needed. In order to answer this threat, in November 2010, NATO leaders decided to develop a ballistic missile defense capability that includes land, sea, and air components that can link together to form a protective shield against ballistic missile attacks. Satellites pick up signals if a ballistic missile is launched from somewhere. The radars afterwards pick up the trace of a ballistic missile, and then afterwards, through command and control, uh, you pass on this information to the interceptors that are eventually able to intercept these missiles. These missiles can travel extremely quickly and strike a target anywhere in their range. In the Mediterranean Sea, U.S. ships with a ballistic missile defense capability are on duty 24 hours a day to intercept potential threats that might appear on their radar. We have seen here recently, and we expect to continue in the future, the uh, proliferation of uh, ballistic missiles technologies across the world. Um, and as those technologies get cheaper and proliferate, potentially into the hands of uh, non-state actors, it's critically important to defend our infrastructure, as well as the infrastructure of our friends and allies. Ships like the USS Donald Cook have advanced sensor capabilities and interceptors that can detect and shoot down ballistic missiles. Combined with the other components placed in Alliance countries and coordinated at a central military base, the system already can connect with satellites to defend against missile attacks. In 2003, under the auspices of the NATO-Russia Council, a study was launched to assess possible levels of interoperability among the theater missile defense systems of NATO allies and Russia. But in April 2014, NATO suspended all cooperation with Russia in response to the Ukraine crisis. NATO has been clear from the beginning that uh, the system that we are building is not intended to defend against Russia. Missile Defense Corporation, I think, is behind us. 
or the attempt to develop missile defense cooperation with Russia is behind us, which doesn't mean that the NATO project will stop. On the contrary, the NATO project continues as planned and as envisaged. NATO's primary role is to defend its member countries. Transatlantic teamwork on ballistic missile defense is bringing this capability one step closer. DIVIDS is a 24-7 operation that provides a timely, accurate, and reliable connection between the media and the military serving worldwide. Through a network of over 200 portable satellite transmitters around the globe and a distribution hub in Atlanta, Georgia, DIVIDS gives you access to the front lines with live and archived broadcast video, still imagery, and print products. Visit our website at dividshub.net and search through our enormous video and photo library. Register on our website to gain complete access to high-definition content, along with breaking news alerts and webcasts from top military officials. For questions or comments about In the Fight or Divids, you can email us at ondemand at dividshub.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As we close, we feature some of the best photos that Divis has to offer. As we listen to Eddie Horst's composition, Pangea. See you next time, In the Fight.